More on this, I want to bring in Cash Patel, former deputy assistant to President Trump, former chief of staff of the Department of Defense, and the author of Government Gangsters. Cash, good to have you back with us. Hey, great to be on the show. So this gag order, as uh, I understand it, he's not okay. allowed to talk about Michael Cohen. He can't talk about Stormy Daniels. He can't talk about David Pecker. And he can't talk about Matthew Colangelo, the guy who came right from the Justice Department and is now prosecuting Trump, right? Well, right, of course. It's the uh, new system of two tiers of justice. Look, as a former federal public defender and a former national security prosecutor who tried over 60 jury trials to verdict, not one time. Did the judge ever preclude the defendant from talking about the proposed witnesses in the case or his defense or literally anything else as long as it didn't lead to any sort of violence or another crime? And for the first time in U.S. history, they are bootstrapping Donald Trump because he is Donald Trump. They can't talk about Michael Cohen, the star witness, convicted felon, swindler, hustler, uh, liar, and the guy who just last month lied to a federal judge to try to get his federal sentence terminated. And, of course, Donald Trump can't talk about Stormy Daniels, and he can't talk about anything else. But this is, this is how they rig the system of justice, and Donald Trump is right. exposing it. My so, only question is, where's the ACLU? Where are all the constitutionalists that said everybody's right to due process yes. is wholesome and complete, except it's Donald in Trump? In fact, my, my impression was always that in a court process, the defendant has the most robust uh, speech protections because yes. they're the one who stands stand accused. Uh, and they can mm -hmm. speak out as much as they like. Usually it's their lawyer who's telling them, hey, don't say too much in public. You may uh, <laughs> make, some, make some sort of impact on the case here. But uh, Trump's a different client, and Trump's been insisting his innocence here. And, and even if he does imperil himself in, sort of, in a legal process, he's entitled to do that, isn't he? That's just it. The due process of the United States Constitution says that a defendant has the right to choose his defense and how he presents it. He's able to take advice from counsel, but it's ultimately up to him. And Donald Trump is being denied that right. On top of that bastardization of due process, Vince, the, the number three Colangelo at the Department of Justice left that office to give the opening statement in a state court trial against Donald Trump. And do you know what he led with? Donald Trump is a man who's guilty of conspiring to commit election fraud. That's not even a charged crime in the indictment. He is alleging that Donald Trump participated in an illegal conspiracy to a jury, which is unconstitutional. If they did not charge with that crime, you cannot talk to the jury about any such conduct. But they can, and they're doing it because they know they're in front of a rigged judge who will let everything in to kneecap Donald so, Trump. But isn't there some risk that comes with the prosecutor overstating what they think they have in the case? So if he comes up there and he says, it's a big conspiracy to steal an election, and the, and they can't prove anything like that to the jury, isn't it? Isn't that overstatement a way for, uh, basically in the end, could be a win for Trump? Is that possible? In the normal course of justice, yes. In New York City, where everybody wants to take Donald Trump out as bad as Angoran and Merchant and the rest of the mainstream media wants to, the chances are very slim. But yes, a prosecutor who overstates his case and is caught short of it usually ends up losing that trial. And that's why we have prosecutorial guidelines. And that's why there's rules of evidence and the due process clause which states, if you don't charge a defendant with criminal conduct, you can't talk about that alleged criminal conduct because it is unconstitutional. But these guys don't care. They're gonna overstep because they know the judge is gonna let them do it and fill the holes for them. Yeah, um, it, it's it's amazing. The other piece is just the what they've they've banded this whole thing together in a way that still doesn't even make any sense to to any legal uh, <laughs> analyst and also to normal people like me who without legal training. Uh, you know, one of the things that Alvin Bragg and company are accusing Trump of is violating a state law in order to violate a federal law, but they won't tell you what federal law he actually violated. How is that even feasible in a court? How can you stand accused? of breaking a law that they don't tell you what law you broke. You can't, but it can only happen when you rig the system of justice. And here, you know, I hearken back to the days of where Hillary Clinton's lawyers prosecuted for using campaign finance dollars illegally to come up with the Steele dossier. Was anyone in the Clinton campaign um, prosecuted for unlawfully using funds to put forth a conspiracy against Donald Trump? And now they want to so prosecute Donald Trump whose secretary put in a ledger while he was president that an X amount of dollars went to a lawyer for a legal payment, and they're going to try to bootstrap that to a felonious conduct activity that may or may not have happened in their imagination. Yes. Of course, it didn't happen in so, reality. That's the extent of it. So so I, I wanna, let me dwell on this comparison for a moment because I think it's really worthwhile. A bunch of people have brought this up, and it's, it's so smart. 
that Hillary Clinton classified the the fake Steele dossier allegations as legal fees for her campaign. And <laughs> and she said, these were legal fees that I paid. And I was like, wait a second. You came up with a fake dossier to attack your political opponent and then, and then sent it around to the media to do that. Uh, and then, of course, it became the basis of a multi-year effort to take Trump down. And Cash, you were right in the center of all of that. You've, you've experienced that, seen how it went. Um, here's the only difference. The reason that's an apple to oranges comparison, this is Trump's own money that's that was used in this case. <laughs> Hillary Clinton right. actually used campaign money when she right. made that claim and said that these were legal expenses. You're right. It's a step even further removed. Donald Trump is allowed to use his money for all lawful purposes, like hiring a lawyer and paying that lawyer legal expenses. Hillary Clinton masqueraded contributions from American citizens for campaign purposes to hijack the system of justice and produce a steel dossier document that she said was for legal services, except she made the FBI use it to illegally spy on her opponent. And she wasn't even prosecuted in state or federal court. So the two-tier system of justice, of course, rolls on. I'm glad people are picking up on this analogy and this differentiation because it just exposes even more the venom with which and the vitriol which was there coming after Donald Trump. So is it your understanding that Trump, as you pointed out earlier, like in New York especially, and uh, you know, given what we guessed to be the composition of this jury to be heavily Democratic, um, that mm -hmm. in the end, Trump is very likely, regardless of how good of a case his own attorneys mount, to be held guilty here and convicted, uh, and then he will prevail potentially on appeal? Is that is that how you see this going? Well, look, as a public defender, we used to have a saying, you only need one. And even in New York, and even in a rigged system of justice, if you get one juror who is competent and willing to follow the law and the actual Constitution, they will find Donald Trump not guilty. And that one juror is the best chance that the defense has in finding him for what we call a hung jury. Because convincing all 12 jurors in New York is going to be very hard. I'm not saying it's impossible. If they followed the facts and the law, they would exonerate Donald Trump overnight. Right. But the reality of where we are and the venue of where we are I think Donald Trump's best strategy perhaps might be to find and focus on that one juror and make sure you hammer it home to him every single day so he holds his ground in the jury room when they're deliberating. So somebody on that defense team needs to be staring at the jury box and figure out who's nodding along as we make our arguments. Yeah, th look, they're, they're, there's a brilliant set of defense lawyers there. They're going through their background. They're going through their social media posts. They're going through their jobs, their affiliations. They're going to know who's in that jury box. He's got a great defense team there, and they're going to put on a great defense. And I think they're going to be able to, with Donald Trump's, of course, assistance, because yeah. who knows people better than Donald Trump to say, that's our guy or that's our gal. So if and you that's get a, who you focus on. It's you, a trial tactic. And if you do get a hung jury, meaning that the jury doesn't agree unanimously to pursue a conviction for Trump, uh, then uh, the, basically that gives prosecutors two options, right? Either drop the case or try and retry it? Right, exactly. And um, good luck retrying it in the middle of an election season with three other cases that um, the judges are going to say, my case takes precedence. Let them have that legal food fight yeah. um, in front of the American public because it will just show how ridiculous of a sham these prosecutions all collectively are. Uh, Cash Patel, talk to me about Joe Biden's administration and their involvement in all of these cases around the country. I just played a CNN clip a moment ago where they're claiming, oh, Trump has no evidence for that. They're, it's based on literally nothing. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, how do you view it? How do you view the, the bigger hand of the Democrat Party in all of these prosecutions? Well, let's go to the videotape or the documents, as it were. NARA and Judge Cannon actually in Florida just released a set of FBI documents which show that NARA, the National Ar Archives librarian, directly communicating with Joe Biden's White House counsel and the Department of Justice to preclude the release of documents that Donald Trump's attorneys have been seeking um, in part of his defense. So they are obviously directly involved. How about another example? Joe Biden himself as president of the United States, vitiated Donald Trump's executive privilege so that the Department of Justice could go forward and prosecute Donald Trump. How can anyone say that Joe Biden, his White House counsel, and his DOJ are not directly tied to these matters? And on top of it all, they tried to cover it all up by preventing the release of these documents. I urge people to go check out Julie Kay's reporting today on what Judge Cannon just released. That's that's a critical. And yeah, that's such a good point. So Biden uh, eradicates Trump's 
uh, executive privilege claims uh, as the current president of the United States. So he has to but get involved in that sense. Uh, the other piece is that you have all of these various prosecutors either meeting with or coming from the Biden administration. So down in Fulton County, Georgia, you have Nathan Wade and all these people who are associated with the Fannie Willis case meeting with, coordinating with the Biden team uh, as they go about going after Trump. I mean, it seems crystal clear to me that there's quite obviously connecting tissue between the, all of these prosecutions. Well, look, that's a great point. The team down in Georgia, Fannie Willis and her lover, Lovebird 2.0, went to the White House the week before Georgia authorized an indictment in that case, and they sat down with the vice president and the White House counsel for six hours at the White House. We know this because Nathan Wade was paid for 24 hours worth of work in that one-day period. So what do you think they talked about, the weather? Of course it's being talked about at the highest levels and orchestrated through White House counsel lawyers and legal, and that's why they're taking these meetings. And I hope the White House logs get exposed even more to show how New York has been involved at the White House and how D.C. and Florida have been involved at the White House, because it's all coming from Joe Biden, as Donald Trump said. Cash Patel, lastly, it seems that the media is beginning to regret cheerleading these trials, at least some of them are, because they, they <laughs> realize that the, the people are supporting Trump in the face of all of this. Andrea Mitchell this weekend was complaining that all of the attention on Trump at these trials is uh, merely clouding out all of Biden's successes. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the media would have all of this time to talk about how successful the Biden administration has been. And the effect of it has been that Trump's support has only grown. Do you anticipate this continuing to backfire for the left? Yeah, because Donald Trump is exposing the two-tier system of justice. He's showing them that they're coming after everyday Americans. He's just the target in the way right now, and he is not going to bend the knee. On top of that, let's talk about Joe Biden. What exactly are they going to discuss in terms of accomplishment? The disaster that is the border, the murdering of innocent Americans by illegal immigrants, the pouring in of Chinese fentanyl, which is killing our youth, two world wars launched on Joe Biden's watch, 13 American soldiers dead in Afghanistan because Joe Biden's politicized withdrawal, and the rise of Russia, China, and Iran, and state sponsor of terror, and American hostages in captivity. What exactly are they going to go out there on the campaign trail and say is better now? $5 for peanut butter and $10 for eggs? $15 for two, two gallons of gasoline. It's ridiculous. They have nothing to run on, and they know it. They should be thanking Donald Trump that he is the center of attention. Yeah. I suspect Andrea Mitchell will not be inviting Cash Patel on as a guest anytime soon. Cash, thank you very much. <laughs>